Good morning, y'all. Um, this is a tremendous pleasure and honor for me to be here uh, on the stage with these two gentlemen. And what we're going to do is talk about uh, who Tom Dent was and about the creation of this book. Uh, and so before I go further, I would like to introduce these, these two lions of, of Louisiana and New Orleans literature to you. Uh, to my immediate right here is Kalamu Yasalam. Uh, and um, he is somebody who has been writing and writing and writing. The, the amount of work he has done is tremendous. Uh, I first came to know about him when I was an undergraduate student at the University of Texas. I took a survey course in black theater history. Uh, and then I came to New Orleans, and there was this amazing uh, piece by Val Ferdinand. Uh, and I came here, Baby Love, I believe it was called. Uh, and I came to New Orleans, and I started working as students at the center, which is an organization that brings, uh, puts students at the center of the curriculum in New Orleans. And I was working for Kalamu and Jim Randalls. And uh, Kalamu, three years into me knowing him, told me that he had a, another name and that he, in fact, was Val Ferdinand. And so I was working for somebody who I studied in college and who I've had the good fortune to have been learning from for the last 20 years. So uh, among his creations, uh, he has, like I said, they are manifold. But the magic of Juju, an appreciation of the black arts movement, is his penultimate. Uh, book that he that he has published, and then that's the newest for the second to the last. That's right, the penultimate, <laughs> and then the new one that he is the uh, editor of, uh, which is the one we are here to celebrate, is New Orleans Grio, the Tom Dent Reader. Um, so please give a warm welcome to Kalamu Yasalam. And then uh, the person who I've gotten to know as we've made this book is, the, is Jerry Ward, who is uh, the man two seats to the right from me. He is, uh, has been in this game forever uh, and has been writing things that I've been admiring for a long time. When I took over the chair at the University of New Orleans Press, I had the great fortune of inheriting his amazing book, one of the really the most important Katrina documents, which is the Katrina Papers, A Journal of Trauma and Recovery. Uh, and his most recent book is a book of poetry called Fractal Songs. So he has contributed uh, an afterword, an essay about Tom Dent and a, lit a literary analysis of Tom Dent. Uh, but he is an ongoing voice uh, documenting all of the work that's being put out in this region and providing literary criticism. If you don't follow him on Facebook, I recommend it. It's in, oftentimes in the middle of the night, the most important thing that I will read comes through across the transom. So, Please give a warm welcome to Jerry Ward. Uh, and then I, in an effort to get off the microphone and let y'all hear from the people who knew Tom Dent, I'm going to start with this question, which is, can you talk about who you were and who Tom Dent was when, the two of, when he came into your life? So uh, please, uh, I'm going to throw it first to uh, Kalamu. And then please tell us who, who you were and who Tom Dent was during that meeting. Uh, good morning. Or good afternoon. Which is it? We're right in the middle. We're right in the middle. Uh, mid -mock. <laughs> I uh, graduated from high school in 1964. And being a typical Negro, I had no idea what I wanted to do other than to keep breathing and to fight against the forces of uh, segregation, which is what I did in, beginning in junior high school. In 64, at St. Augustine High School, where I, when I graduated, they sent me to, I say they sent me to Carlton College in Northfield, Minnesota, as far away as they could get, get me from New Orleans. And uh, I spent the winter at Carlton <laughs> College, and it, which included um, a two-week break for transfer, uh, not transfer, exchange students. Uh, Jerry knows something about this, the exchange student program. And there were 13 black students at Carlton that year that I was there. Eight of us were first year students. And when I heard about that exchange program at Fish University, 
in Tennessee, Nashville, I was on it. <laughs> and I never will forget that the, one of the counselors at Carlton tried their best to talk me out of it. Well, you see, this is for Carlton students to go to, I'm a Carlton student. <laughs> but, <laughs> but it was meant to be an exchange, of, you know, of students with, with, with fists. I know where fists is. <laughs> <laughs> and, well, we, we set it up so that there could be an exchange of programs with black students. I, I can talk to black people. <laughs> and it, it went, uh, <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> um, I spent two weeks in, in Nashville. And when I got there, one of the two people I met for the first time, one was a student at the time. Her name was Nikki Giovanni. And the other was a professor, John Oliver Killens. Um, and so when I got back to Minnesota, uh, being in the South for a minute it cleared my brain. And I said, I can't stay up here. This is, this is too cold. And so I came back home. And that was the first year after high school. When I came back home, still being a Negro, not knowing what I wanted to do, um, I was doing nothing, basically. I just dropped out of school. And my mother, this was 19, by then it's 1964. My mother, my dear mother, and her deep concern for her, her son said, they're going to come and get you. And she didn't have to tell me who they was. And, what coming to get me meant. I went down to the custom house. No, not to the custom house. I went to the federal building, which was where the, you know, the main post office, the little building, a little bit of the tall building next to it, next to the main post. It's, a, it's connected to the post office. If you walk through there, you went up, I think it was on the 11th floor or whatever. And the matronly white woman who was at the desk when I walked in, asked me a couple of questions. When was my birthday? Had I registered for the draft? I had not registered for the draft. That's why I was down here. Oh, you're down here to register where you are, you, you are breaking the law. We're going to deal with you. You come back here tomorrow at 12 o'clock, and we will deal with your case. And so I walked out of there and went to the custom house near here on Canal Street, and that's where, the, I don't know about now, but at the Custom House, they used to have all the recruiting stations for the uh, military. And being supremely, I'm still a Negro, ignorant, I just <laughs> walked up to the first when I got to, which was, I think, the Army, and told them, I want to go, I want to sign up, but I want to, go someplace other than Vietnam. As I say, this was 65. The man looked at me, what do you, he said, oh, we don't, you know, I said, he was trying to explain, to, people always trying to explain stuff to me. Jerry, why is this? <laughs> and, and so ultimately he said, you have to take a test for that. I said, give me the test. So they gave me a test, and I'm cut the story short out of deference to my elder. And um, I passed the test, ended up at uh, Fort Bliss, Texas, uh, studying Nike Hercules nuclear missile. And I was in, involved in chemical, no, radiological, chemi radiological and chemical warfare and was the also electronic missile repair for the Nike Hercules nuclear missile. And I spent a year, uh, not quite a year at, at Fort Bliss, and then from Fort Bliss went to, was sent to Korea, spent a year in Korea, in the mountains of Korea, about, oh, about 50 miles from the, the uh, DMZ. 
in the mountains. So, I mean, there wasn't even any name for it. We just, you know, we just there. And then came back to Fort Bliss and was mustered out at Fort Bliss. And by now it's 1968. And during the years I was, that year away from New Orleans, the, uh, three years away from New Orleans, um, my girlfriend at the time, Thelma Thomas, she and I had kept up our relationship by correspondence. And she wrote, to told me, and shortly before I mustered out, she wrote me a letter letting me know that there were three theater groups in New Orleans. There was the Nat Turner Theater, the Dashiki Theater, and the Free Southern Theater. And she wrote and gave me a, her overview of each one of them and suggested that I might want to join the Free Southern Theater. Um, and when I got back in June of, of 68, I immediately checked out all three of them, but I really joined, ended up joining the Free Southern Theater, and that's when I met Tom Dent in June of 1968. And um, I, I thought I had been in love uh, with my girlfriend, but with Tom, there was an affinity that you don't explain, you either accept it or reject it. And from then until his death, um, we were together. That's how I met Tom Dan. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, uh, 1964 was a very good year. Uh, as uh, Kalama has told you, he was getting out of high school. And being his elder, I finished college that year. And I very much knew what I wanted to do. Uh, I had done my undergraduate degree in mathematics and physics. But I was uh, much more interested in literature. I didn't know I was interested in writing. I didn't know I was interested in literature. So the, the important thing about uh, 64 is that it might have been for both of us the uh, beginning of uh, some kinds of journeys that would lead uh, ultimately to our <coughs> being connected with Tom Dent. It was not until nine years later in 1973 uh, and, and I was uh, already back from having uh, visited the uh, Customs House when I was inducted into the U.S. Army and sent to, uh, no, I was sent to Fort Polk first, which we called by another name here because I didn't like the armadillos out there, Fort Puke. <laughs> and it was... Uh, <laughs> So I spent some time there and then went to Fort Knox. You see, I always went to the best of places. <laughs> and then I was looking at all of the uh, service people who had been napalmed in the U.S. Ireland Army Hospital. And when I got my orders saying that I was going to Vietnam, I said, okay, but the snakes shall not bite me and I'm not going to be napalmed, and I won't be mad when I come back. The snakes did not bite. I, not, I, didn't, uh, I wasn't injured by napalm. I was not shot. Whether I was sane when I returned is anybody's guess. I'll just put it this way. Don't mess with me, because you might be hurt. In 1970, I got an invitation before I uh, got out of the Army to return to my undergraduate school as a teacher, which I gladly did, because I had discovered wonderful things about what was going on. Uh, the uh, important landmark anthology, Black Fire, edited by uh, Leroy Jones and Larry Neal, I, I got, when I was still at uh, Fort Knox, I got 
uh, the freelance pallbearers by Ishmael Reed when I was in Vietnam. So I was uh, trying to keep up with things, and I became really very angry in Vietnam when I saw photographs of the uh, dormitory that had been shot up at Jackson State, which I knew very well. So I returned to Tougaloo College as a teacher, and a woman who became a friend of mine, Margaret Walker, decided that she needed to have a major conference for women poets in honor of Phyllis Wheatley in 1973. So the legendary Phyllis Wheatley Festival took place at Jackson State uh, College. It had not yet become a university. Tom and a number of people from New Orleans came, and I had, uh, I knew something of Tom from various magazines. I'd read some of his work, and I said to someone who knew him, I said, well, tell him to stop by my house. I, I was then living on campus, and he did. And we had this wonderful conversation. And our 25 years of friendship began. Because from the Phyllis Wheatley conference to his death, Tom and I were always involved in something together. Um, if it was not uh, Tom calling me up and telling me about the boat that smashed into the Jack's Brewery and having me laughing all over the telephone. It was Tom at my house making notes for some work that he wanted. And he was one of the few people who had the, the, the right or the privilege or whatever you want to call it to have a key to my house. And I would be a, away and Tom would, would uh, uh, flee from New Orleans because it, uh, he was, uh, he needed the time and space to write and he'd occupy my apartment. And I would come to New Orleans to stay with Tom and I thought everything was wonderful. This, this is um, very important, uh, the, the thread that uh, Kalama and I are, are beginning here. And it has to do with how people who knew Tom get to know other people who knew Tom. And there is a web that it's a very natural thing. It was not that people uh, said, oh, I want to know this particular writer because that writer will be able to give me entree to some other writer or I can use this writer to leverage something for myself. It was a very natural thing because I didn't know who Tom's friends were. Uh, I did know quite a bit about the FST because I was present at the creation, as it were. The FST was founded at Tougaloo College before I graduated by uh, Gil Moses, uh, Doris Derby, and uh, John O'Neill. In fact, the great education I got at Tougaloo was dual, both in the classroom and outside, because it was an oasis for everyone in the civil rights movement. So uh, it was just uh, a matter of, uh, let us say, accident. These things do happen in life that I should get to know Tom Dent. And having gotten to know Tom, I would then become friends with people like Kalamu and uh, Chakula Chajua, uh, Corvallis Jexbro and her husband Raymond Bro, and dozens of other people. And most importantly, uh, a late friend of ours, uh, Kalamu, uh, Lorenzo Thomas, wow. yes, who had been in Umbra with Tom, and he was the baby in Umbra because he was the youngest member of the group. Okay, just two quick footnotes. You mentioned um, the key, right, that uh, You gave Tom a key to your apartment. Tom had given me a key to his apartment. And, uh, 
was that it was we'd never talked about this before, but when you said kid, it just came off the top. Um, and there's value in listening to others, particularly people you think you know, but you put them in a different context and ask them to start talking. You find out things that you didn't know that you had in common. So it's key. If somebody had asked me to write about Tom before, I never would have mentioned a key. But the, the thing about the key is that it represents, I won't go into the Freudian thing about with the key and, and the penis. I'm not going to go that way. <laughs> that's an old trick. When you say what you're not going to do, that's a way of saying it. <laughs> but the other way, the key represents, on a metaphorical sense, that's the kernel to help you understand something. That's the key to that, right? But the other key is what you use to lock up or keep safe some things. And sometimes you cannot get to the treasure if you don't have the key. And so this, this moment was a, a key moment for me. Uh, one of the things I was struck by as y'all talked about the way that your lives came together and the role Tom played in it is the role, the way organizing happened so much of this time, the way the civil rights movement was knitted together with the black arts movement, was knitted together with all the kinds of other literary organizing that was happening. I guess my question that I'd like you both to talk about is, what were the ways that Tom saw his role in the civil rights movement? And what, in what ways did that, the way he saw his own role influence the way your roles have, have come to you and, and the way you have played your role over time? In what sense inspiration did you take from him in, in that role? Well, Tugaloo was important because the civil rights quote unquote, the civil rights movement, as far as I'm concerned, had, there were a number of critical places. And one of those critical, you, I mean, you know Nashville. New Orleans was not often presented as a critical place of the civil rights movement. But in fact, it, it wasn't, at another time we can go into that. But and of course, you know, Atlanta and Birmingham and so forth and so on. But one of the most critical places was Tougaloo because it was, I guess you say in terms of the jurisdiction, just outside of Jackson at the time. And Jackson was the epicenter for the Mississippi aspect of, of, of the movement. So Tom had, um, I mean, you could have called him Ulysses in a sense. You know that poem that Leon, uh, not Leon, uh, Lorenzo has. Mm, yes. Yeah, about Ulysses. Uh, and he's, poem goes, you know, so thought, so, y'all know Ulysses, right? He said, but this, this was black folks, so this was Otis. And, <laughs> and he talked about that journeying. And Tom was a person who would drive all throughout the South. So his book, Southern, Tom's book, Southern Journey, was based on his driving about throughout the South. Tom got, in Mississippi, in terms of Mississippi, Tugaloo was the epicenter. There's so many people that have passed through Tugaloo. Uh, um, you can name like Alice Walker. That's how we hooked up via, you mentioned Margaret Walker. So, I mean, it, it goes on and on and on and on and on. We don't have time to just free associate, but that's, that, I think that's important for people to understand. And Tom, was the first person whom I physically knew. When I say physically knew, I mean, you read about people, you can read books, you can read newspapers, 
uh, the Village Voice was a major newspaper at the time, and you could see all these names and so forth and so on. So uh, Ishmael Reed, I had read him while I was in the Army, but it was through Tom that I got to know Ishmael Reed, the person, because Tom would invite people to New Orleans whom he knew from all over. He would drive, and so we drove literally riding in vehicles from as far west as uh, San Antonio. In fact, we had a race going into San Antonio with the Free Southern Theater, two, two, a van and a, a station wagon. And we were racing from New Orleans to San Antonio. Let's show you how crazy we were. See who's going to get there first, right? And we got came off the expressway. There was a the ramp to go into San Antonio. We came off side by side, so nobody had bragging rights <laughs> about, about it. It was crazy. But Tom would take us all over the place. So we went from as far west as uh, San Antonio, somewhere up north in, in Ohio, and to the east coast, we went out to the Carolinas, uh, and then down to Florida, driving around with Tom. If you can imagine, this is, you know, the 70s, and we're driving throughout the South as part of the Free Southern Theater and what have you, and Jerry and I hooked up in, as, because of Tom at Tugaloo. Uh, college, Tom, that was that was just, going up to Jackson was just a everyday thing. I remember w one day, we went to Jackson early in the morning, came back to New Orleans to pick up some people, to bring them back up to Jackson for a, a program, and then we came back to New Orleans. I um, mean, y'all wouldn't even think about doing that today, but, you know, we were young and crazy, and Negro. Abram, to answer your question, there is one word. That word is purpose. And I will turn to the book that I hope many of you will purchase and read. I have uh, an interview with Tom, one of the interviews with Tom. This one was done in 1996 but it was first published in Xavier Review, so I'm not going to read it from uh, the book. I'm going to read it from Xavier Review. Uh, there were two questions at the end of my interview with Tom that uh, I think helped people to understand a great deal about him and the question you, you are asking about, well, what was Tom's take on all of the things that were happening in his life from 1938, uh, that would include World War II, the Cold War period, the uh, intensification of segregation, and the long struggle in civil rights, which I hope people will please understand did not start in the 20th century. It is a 19th century phenomenon. And I am always truly pissed off with people who think the civil rights movement started in 1960. So I asked Tom, where is Tom Dent the writer going now? And he answered, where I want to go now is to begin through subjective essays, some fiction, and other kinds of non-fictional material which uses imaginative devices to really render New Orleans, which I see as far more important than just one city in the South, but as a microcosm of black communities throughout the African diaspora, to really render it as it has never been rendered before. And as a black southerner with perspectives through my ancestry and through travels with Free Southern Theater and work with Andrew Young in Atlanta, through experiences in Texas and Mississippi as well as New Orleans, to write an honest, revealing, imaginative portrait of the South. 
Such a perspective is pretty much ignored now in the rush to homogenize and smooth over the sharp edges of racial history and conflict. And I said, so you want to give us back the jagged edges? Having in mind how that phrase had been used by Ralph Ellison in describing Richard Wright's black boy. Tom said, we have to, because if we don't, there will be no progress. Progress requires a critical dimension toward our struggle to establish and authenticate our culture, a critical dimension toward the political progress that we have hoped for through our elected officials, but have not always seen materialize, a critical dimension toward our mad dash for improved economic opportunity while we forget the people in the projects and the poorest among us. A broadening of our vision to include what is happening first in Africa, then in the Afro-Caribbean, and finally with people throughout the world who have been oppressed and exploited. We as blacks are in the best position, having suffered as we have in America, to provide such a critical and widening vision. I hope my work will be considered part of that effort, purpose. Because Tom Dent, native of New Orleans, like Richard Wright, native of the surround area near Natchez, had an international vision that we need still, that we can use still. And I think perhaps in our fascination with the exoticness of the city that we live in, although we recognize it is international, we think the international part is always coming from the outside. It's the immigrants who are coming in and rebaptizing New Orleans and making it the most un-American city uh, in, in, in our nation. But it is what has occurred in this place before 300 years and is occurring now that's important. And I think we're going to talk about keys. We're going to talk about people who understood history as a particular kind of narrative that we write and rewrite. Tom understood that, and that's what he spent his time doing, whether he was writing about music, whether he was introducing me to Walter Washington, um, whether he was uh, suggesting that we should go somewhere and have coffee at 3 o'clock in the morning like Igor's, where I, I was amazed. People are doing their laundry here at Hammock? Oh, yes, they are. You know, the trolley car, whatever. So it's, it's a, a, a very important part of the New Orleans tricentennial history that you're not going to get unless you do read Neo Griot, the Tom Dent reader, and then raise some very important questions about how what I just quoted from this interview, the, the, the last answer that Tom gave me in the interview, relates to 2018. Because, you know, I'm, I, I'm, I'm a good Roman Catholic, and uh, I, I would like to suggest that you should abandon hope. I think it's so cheap, you should abandon hope. Your fellow citizens elected 666. Whether, I, and I don't care if you belong to the, to the tribe, or you're part of what is called a base. We are governed by 666. So while I am not about to dance with the devil. 
I am not going to fool myself and believe that the future is bright. The kind of work that Tom was doing is a work that we must continue in the name of purpose. Here, here. You see why I say that's my elder? <laughs> So uh, I want to return to what you've just brought out, which is the jagged edges. I mean, the what Tom is excavating and making us look at in a lot of this work, in ritual murder, in his poetry, in the examination that he gives of the civil rights and the civil rights movement, as as Jerry said, a century and a half later, but also 25 years on from from that summer that he was documenting. What are the jagged edges? do you feel that Tom was trying to show us and that this book brings forward again? Which, are the, which specific jagged edges do you think this moment in time calls for in addition to um, the one you just described? I feel like there, there's so much about this book that as Kalamu um, brought it forward, I was just surprised by how fresh it felt to me. And it felt like it was in the zeitgeist of this exact moment. Well, Kalamu very cleverly included a, a most important document in this book, and it's a letter to Dr. Brayboy. Mm. And that's very important because as we notice identity being commercialized almost as a major problem in our nation, Am I biracial? Am I triracial? And I'm not quite sure how do you manage being triracial, but anyway, it happens. You know, I mean, we all have various mixtures in our DNA structure, so we are all multiracial, and we are all people of color. So if you think you are a person who has no color, I would suggest you use that ancient mirror back there. It'll show you exactly what color you are. The, 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 uh, the, the, the point is that Tom's work, the jagged edges, are everywhere. If we want to deal with um, ritual murder, first of all, let us understand what is there. That is not just simply about two young black men in New Orleans friends who get into an argument on a Saturday night and one kills the other. It is about two males who are friends who get into an argument and one kills the other. It is about the impossibility of ever explaining why a young man decides that he has an entitlement to walk into a school and kill 17 people. Or another young man believes he has the entitlement to pray with people and to kill nine of them in a church. You are amazed, and certainly our news media does a regrettably poor job of dealing with the news because everyone in the news media is completely baffled about how to explain suddenly that so-called white people are very happy to kill so-called white people. Well, did you forget who was killing who in World War I and in World War II? Is your cultural amnesia so strong that you cannot understand that the history of the world has been one of violence, that our nation was founded in violence? And the one thing that we seem to forget, and even Tom did not give attention to, is that in this country, we walk on the bones and the blood of indigenous peoples and tell them, you should not complain if we want to run an oil pipeline through your sacred land because it is not sacred. It belongs to us, no longer to you and your spirits. Tom made us aware of contradictions. Tom made us aware 
that there was nothing in the world that was not related to something else. So then when he writes or wrote to me from uh, Senegambia, where he had gone with uh, Mendy. Gabriel Mendy, a friend of his, it was in fact the last doctor he had, they went back and Tom told me wonderful stories of that, or he, would, he introduced me to uh, uh, Kamal Brathwaite. I mean, this, this uh, from the Caribbean and a few other people, you see, it's the interconnectedness. It's asking the right question. It's facing life as it is. The jagged edges are there and they are cutting our flesh daily. That's the, the point, Abram, that I wanna make. They're cutting our, our flesh daily. You come from a group of people who have had to agonize since 1945 over something called the Holocaust. And it is, uh, uh, and, 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 and they still have to agonize over it because that ghost, that specter, may have gone underground for a while, but I assure you it is coming back full force for everybody. So it's almost as I just walked around this hotel and I told Kalama, I said, I thought I was in the matrix. And he said, what do you mean? I said, that is so much about life today is unreal. And I think Tom, in, in his own way, when he was writing, when he was writing and thinking very, very carefully about life and trying to put it together, what is the music about? What is the film about? What is the middle class to which he belonged and had this agony that he was describing to Dr. Brayboy about, I don't wanna be like my parents, but I, I'm not going to kill my parents. How, how, do I, how do I become myself? Well, it's very interesting that I never had that problem because I come from, uh, I didn't come from the upper middle class like Tom. And so the question of class and identity is not very important for me because I could give a damn. You know, I am who I am, and if you like it, fine, and if you don't, that's fine too. Langston Hughes and I keep saying we're doing the best we can, whether you like it or not. So the, uh, the, the point is we have to deal with the contradictions of, t of 2018. And we cannot say whether we voted for Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump that we are innocent because we're not. We are all guilty. Flesh, the jagged edges are here and cutting our flesh daily. You may quote that. I'm going to. The but jagged sure edges that you are give here. It the right attribution. <laughs> Will do. Kalama, well, did you want to talk about the jagged edges? No. All right. <laughs> um, well, I have one more question before I turn it over to to y'all, which is. Um, the, I think Jerry was talking about the edges of this just now. Um, but in, in this book, I was really struck by Tom's intense need to reveal and pull back and examine honestly. It's one of the most considered um, and stable. Our, the point of view of the writer in this is one of the most clear-eyed and stable. And, and uh, I want to just talk about uh, where what that was like in person, and then what parts of that you think live on in other people's writing, because I know that a big part of what you all talked about Tom doing is creating the scene around him, this world, this demimon, in which, and the reason Kalamu, maybe you'll talk to us about why you chose this title for the book and why, uh, what that work was like for Tom, because that's, although he has 23 linear feet at, at Amistad, he, a lot of his work is actually in the creation of this whole world of, of let, let arts and letters. Yeah, but when you say 23 linear feet, I'm not sure that people understand. If you take manuscripts, notebooks, and uh, papers and stack them one on top of the other, it would stretch up 23 feet. That was Tom's literary output. 
and I, um, I was blessed to be present and, and, and to know Tom and be friends with Tom, comrades, um, during the, the creation of much of that. But you can be present and not uh, fully understand. And I didn't fully understand the impact and import of Tom's work until many years later, Abram, when you suggested that we might need a Tom Dent uh, reader or book, would you be interested, Kalamu? Yeah, okay, sure, I thought it was gonna be a snap. You know, I knew Tom a long time, blah, blah, blah. Went up to Amistad where the papers were. And it was then that I realized I might have been present when a lot of that was going on, but I was but a baby. You know, like if we all, we all think back to our earliest memories, and most of us don't get beyond, too much beyond six or seven years old. But there were memories before then. You understand what I'm saying? And so I was a baby when I met Tom in that sense. And I had the, the pleasure of meeting Tom again when I was introduced to Tom's work in order to put the book together. And as quote unquote big as this book is, it's but a small fraction of the work. The real work of, of producing this book was to figure out what to leave out. I mean, there was so much, work, and I had, I had no knowledge that he had produced that much work, 129 linear feet. I mean, you know, that's taller than most of the houses we live in. You understand what I'm saying? Can you imagine right, doing that much writing? That that you know. That was, it was, it's immense. Um, three quick things. One, Tom gave us directly, not through lectures, not through the writing specifically, but through daily experience, he gave us intro and introduced to us the importance of meeting people and meeting people where they are. So when you went to, when I'd go hang out with Tom, invariably we didn't stay in, at his apartment. We would go someplace else and meet some other people, sit in the Levadas or wherever, or go around the Dookies or wherever, and then we'd meet some people and we'd talk and so forth and so on. Well, Tom was like that in the city but he was also like that internationally. And I didn't fully realize the importance of this. But whenever we come to meet with Tom, then we always met people. He was always introducing us to people, literally introducing us to people. So you go to Tom's house, and one day there was James Baldwin sitting there. I mean, literally, James Baldwin is sitting there in Tom's, Tom's house, and you end up talking with him, and the three of y'all go hang out, uh, you know, I don't know if you, if you all can envision this, but this man was incredible in, in that. So he never said to us, you have to read this person, this person. But we got introduced to all these people, Skunder, and, and then the person I consider the greatest living poet of the Western Hemisphere, Kamal Brathwaite. You know, he would, you walk in the door and that man is sitting there, right there, you know? And you realize later on, and this is, a, this is an important thing, and at the same time, it's not just quote unquote name people, but it's the guy from around the corner would be that, you know, so forth and so on. There's, there's people that Tom knew all over. I met Worth Long, who was one of the um, uh, SNCC workers, and Worth was up in Little Rock, Arkansas, you know, Tom had people from New York, and he goes on. Up. The ritual murder is Tom's major play. And in doing the research for this book, I ran across the letter, not letter, one of the, it wasn't a letter, it was 
part of Tom's journaling in which he describes a scene that later developed into ritual murder, that he was, in a sense, reporting on what actually happened. He was going uh, uptown somewhere, and he passed the place, and there was a crowd outside, and, and he thought, well, something must be going on, but he just went on, went, and then when he was coming back, he passed back by the place, and there was still a lot of people, so he, he stopped the car and got out, and he found out a person had been shot and so forth and so on, and he talked to people, and, and he, he noted that down. And in his notes, as I read his notes, I recognized that this was ritual murder. This was where ritual murder came from. And so Tom did not, it wasn't just creative in the sense of imagination. He was constantly in the streets and drawing on the social reality around him. The third thing is um, the immensity of Tom's output cannot be overstated. I know I mentioned the, you know, the linear feet and all like that, but you cannot fully appreciate how far ranging this man's mind was to, to, to do all that. And he influenced so many of us to begin to think of the world in two ways, to think of the world as the spot where we are, to know where you are, where you are at this moment. <laughs> or as the old folks say, who that boy's parents is, you know, who is that boy's people is, who, who you hang out with, know, to know that, but also to know that there's a larger world out there, and you should interface with that larger world so that there were people we met at Tom's that didn't live here. I can remember, um, what's her name? Um, the Nobel, Nobel laureate. Tony Morrison. Tony Morrison. The two Tonys would be Tony Cabe and Byron, Tony Morris. They would be here, and we got to meet. I mean, can you imagine? That's what Tom did. And that's, that's what is often lost for, for many people. You don't realize that people are people, and Tom, <laughs> you know, I mean, you think people are not just names. Tony Morrison is not just a name. I, you know, I see Tony Morrison sitting on a, on a stoop waiting for, you know, Tootie to come out on Mardi Gras Day, you know, with Tom. That's the way you, I'm good. <laughs> well, that's, a good mic, that's a good mic drop moment. So did you want to? Well, the only thing that I, because I really would like to talk with people, or the people in the audience, uh, the only thing I would uh, suggest uh, about Kalama and myself is that uh, Tom connected us and that connection is a part of tradition. I think this is very important. It's not just simply that Tom connected us, but it's the kind of thing that uh, we have done and continue to do. This morning, before I came here, the uh, mail came with this book, Embers Among the Ashes, Poems in a Haiku Manner by Charlie Braxton. Uh, there's an introduction by Kalama Yasalan for this book. But the author, in his acknowledgement, says he began writing the book because he accepted a challenge that I gave him. And the author is someone I reached out to when he was a very young student at Jackson State College, and I've been somehow important in his life all this time as Tom was in our lives. So I'm suggesting that when you think about tradition, um, maybe many people think of tradition in the individual talent uh, by T.S. Eliot. But when I think of tradition, 
I'm thinking much more of what African American peoples and other people have done for a very long time, and that is to transmit something. And the transmission is not a museum. It's not for a museum. It's how you how you transmit something to younger people who then do something with even younger people, and this goes on and on and on. And I see um, myself and Kalamu very differently standing in that particular stream if I were going to make it a river, that uh, uh, we, we're there and we're noticing that nothing remains the same and nothing can really be retained. Our memory can be retained, but nothing can be retained because the dynamics, the hydraulics of a river are so complex uh, that uh, everything is always changing. And that's the only thing we have in the world. And our tradition is to, by remembering Tom, remembering his work, and the work of many other people, those people he connected us with, and some that he did not, is through this ongoing activity. We're not, I, I'm not, neither of us, uh, well, I, I will just speak for myself. I, Kalama speaks for himself. Uh, we're not hungering after fame. Or as Norman Mailer said, fame is a bitch goddess. You better be careful about it. Okay? Uh, we don't, I, 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 don't, I don't go hungering after fame. And in fact, I'm surprised that people throughout America sometimes seem to know who I am. They surprised me and say, oh, you're Jerry Ward. I said, I, I was yesterday. I think <laughs> I am today. I'm not sure, <laughs> you know. But I, I don't, I'm not interested in being famous. I think being famous is a curse sometimes for some people because you become famous and self-important and your ego grows obese and you forget the basic lessons about caring for little people who suffer. And if you forget that, you lose your humanity. Well, a round of applause for our two panelists today. Thank you both very, very much. Uh, and I would like to open the floor now up for questions. So Anyone people who have questions, have comments. questions, or, on questions or comments. Yeah. Uh, I'm very ignorant of Mr. Dent, I have to say. So may I ask a, a real basic question? Something about, can you tell us something about his background in terms of his family, et cetera, and how that influenced the man he became? Yeah, the, that's part of the reason for the book, but to give you the, the short, short answer, um, Tom was the son of Albert Dent, who was the president of Dillard University. And Tom grew up, as Jerry was noting, in an upper middle class black family here. Tom left New Orleans to go to school, first in Atlanta, Morehouse. There's a joke about Morehouse and Negroes, but I won't go into that. And, <laughs> well, and then, dead, so. yeah, as well. Morehouse. Yes, and then to Syracuse, which is, at that time, was famous because of Jim Brown, football player, but at Syracuse, Tom studied, in an, it was involved in international studies, and it was during that time that Tom, uh, and it, there's an essay in the book, he talks about his, uh, Tom's friendship with Dave Brubeck, because Tom was studying Polish, literature at Syracuse, and Brubeck was of Polish 
I mean, there, there are all kinds of connections that, that you would never think of. And so that, that's part of Tom's background. So before he came, then he came back, he was part of the, um, what was the, the Legal Defense Fund, the NAACP Legal, Legal Defense, Defense Fund in New York City was working and worked at a newspaper in New York, and that's in here also, he talks about that. And then came home um, supposedly to, you know, visit his parents and what have you, and then was going back to New York because he had been educated at Syracuse and then had friends in New York and had developed what was called the Umber Society in New York, which had many of the then budding young black writers. We, you've heard the name Ishmael Reed, uh, David Henderson, Calvin Hurton, uh, so forth and so on. But when he came back to New York, from New York, came to New Orleans, was supposed to stay here a couple of months and never left. I mean, he really, he literally was reborn in the city. And that's, that's the brief overview. That's why uh, when Jerry mentioned the essay about Mr. Uh, uh, Brayboy, the letter to Brayboy, again, if you go, I mean, if you're really interested in that, he talks about that aspect, the, the psychodynamics of identity and his particular struggle was to figure out how he could contribute in his time and place, given what was going on at the time. And what was going on at the time of the 60s and the 70s was in much like today, where there's so much ferment going, social ferment going on. And if you come from a background that is upper middle class, then you are not encouraged to get out into the streets and demonstrate what have you. You would be encouraged to work quietly in the suites and sit down with the people and so forth and so on. But Tom had come to the conclusion that he had to be in the street. And so that was his 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 struggle. And that's that's not a unique struggle. And that's why I mentioned some of those other things. That's a struggle that goes on and on and on. Anybody who has come from a background in which there is money, let's put it bluntly, you come from a background in which there is money, that money came from somewhere, whether you know it, knew it or not when you were born. And then you come up during a period of social upheaval, you have that question, what is my responsibility? You know, what am, and that's, that's what Tom addressed, and as I said, much of it is here, in the, particularly in the first parts of the, of the book where we go over that. I wanted to ask you how much of his work has actually been published and then how much has been translated into other languages? There's not much that I know of that has been translated into other languages and the bulk of Tom's work has not been published. That's why this book is in many ways the largest book that Tom did, um, Southern Journey, which is a book of, about him driving through the South, um, came out and was, unfortunately, Southern Journey, you don't, if you don't know anything about Tom and you don't know his literary work, you have no way of knowing. He did so much work. Southern Journey when, is very tightly focused on revisiting the sites of the major uh, civil rights movement cities. He re literally drove back through the South, talked to people and so forth and so on who had been involved in those struggles and made notes about it and so that's what that book is. But to understand Tom's work, which included poetry, drama, reportage, um, it's 
you, you, you can speak to that. Uh, one of the things uh, that Jerry Ward contributed to this was the, the his essentially the stuff that ha is in print. So you have in the book a listing of everything that has been printed. Uh, I don't know if it's an exhaustive list, but it's a pretty it's a pretty deep list of, was, of all the things that yeah, are in print. It was ex as exhaustive as it could be at the time of its publication. There was a couple of things probably that are not there that Tom mm -hmm. did just before he died, but basically he got it. And one of the things I love about Tom and that I relate to is that he also had the, had the means of production. So Tom ran several different literary magazines, and so in that sense he was doing the work of bringing other voices out, but also in that process was capable of publishing his own thoughts. And so as somebody who's in publishing, you know, that's one of the ways I really admire and relate to his work. One quick thing I should say, I'm, I'm a flag bearer. I'm, I mean, I fly this flag high. Tom was the greatest New Orleans born writer of any time period. You cannot come up with another person who was born in New Orleans and reared in New Orleans who was also a writer and produced as much work. Not even, you don't, we don't even have to talk about quality, you can just talk about quantity. There, there's nobody else. There's no, and I always challenge people. So yeah, I, that's the challenge. If you know of any New Orleans writer, New Orleans born writer, who was greater than Tom Dent, tell me about it now. We can have a, a, <laughs> a wrestling match between, between them. <laughs> I was very shocked when I learned that Tom Dent had passed away. Uh, was that a surprise, or did you know that he was in ill health? And uh, I'm sorry if I can just add one other little question. When you said that whether we voted for Trump or for Clinton, we are all guilty, would you care to elaborate on that point? Why don't you elaborate on that point if you want to do it? Well, that's I'll have to do the elaborating story, because that was my point. What I'm saying is that we need not pretend that we are victims. We are all, we proudly say, citizens of the United States of America. And as such, we either have to push back and so the FBI can come and arrest me we have to push back ultimately and restore democracy because democracy has drifted into an arena that was prepared before World War II with fascist interests in this country that's why we had people who were supporting Hitler who were Americans, as well as people who were Americans who were fighting what Hitler stood for. And if you understand anything about ideology and politics, and you understand what is the daily drama coming from 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue and you say, oh, that too shall pass. No, it is not going to pass unless you help it to pass. That's why I'm saying we cannot claim innocence, regardless of our political commitments and our political beliefs. Because we are stuck. We're as stuck as someone who's sitting on a ton of chewing gum, well chewed. Is it how, how did Tom pass and, that, and was it expected? Or is it, you know, when, oh. and when and what were the circumstances of Tom's death? Yeah, I, um, I'm, I'm not good with years, but. 1998. Yeah, June of I, um, I have known, as you've heard already, I've known Tom long time and I had an invitation to go to Germany with uh, 
creative work. And usually if I would travel out of the country or Tom would travel out of the country, we would always get together before we left. As it's sort of a, I won't call it morbid, I, I should say sort of our recognition that life is fleeting and you never know. So when one of, ever one of us was going to be gone for a while, we would try and get together right before and, and just talk and what have you. So I had this invitation to go to Germany. And when I got the invitation and reached out to talk to Tom about it, uh, he said, yeah, you ought to go and blah, blah, blah. You'll find this and that and the other. And as the time drew nigh, Tom fell, fell ill. And I remember going to the hospital and sitting at Tom's bedside just before I left for Munich, Germany. Uh, and we talked. And I had this... Um, premonition that Tom was going to die before I got back. And I was in Munich and went to Auschwitz to, and was looking at the ex, you know, exhibit and what have you. And when I returned, Tom had passed when I came back from Munich, and it turns out that I saw Tom, it was a Sunday or a Monday, I forget which day of the week, but he died that Saturday, was it? That Saturday, while, while I was gone. And this is something that is, uh, again, <laughs> this is not directly to your question, but it's happened to me a couple of times. I was in... Um, Nicaragua, when my grandmother died, uh, and nobody could reach me because we were running around with the Sandinistas all over Nicaragua. Uh, there was no, there was no way to contact us. I mean, you didn't cell phones. There wasn't, there wasn't nothing. <laughs> you had to get. <laughs> We were in places where you had to get on a borrow, I mean, a, a donkey, or, or a boat to to find us. All, all I'm, I'm. So anyway, to that question of, of Tom's passing, um, that's that's where I was. I was in Germany when Tom died. All right, one last question. Thank you all so much. This is incredibly illuminating, and I, I appreciate the, the fact of this book. Many of us readers in this town have been waiting for a book of his work like this for many years, and we're all very grateful to you for what you've done. I guess I'd like to ask you to do maybe something slightly different, which is in this portrait that uh, you have painted of a literary demigod, <laughs> I'm wondering, out of affection and uh, respect for Tom, could you humanize him in a different way and maybe talk about what you thought he got wrong or arguments that you had with him where you didn't see eye to eye? I mean, we're all necessarily limited as people and as writers. And I'm curious, in your experiences with him or your readings of his work, do you feel like there were things that, that you guys didn't walk in exact alignment on in different ways? And, and in so doing and reflecting on that, how, how did both of you learn from those encounters? Well, we, I think you... you posing the question as though it was um, there were diametrical there's diametrical opposition which is a, 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 a philosophical way of looking at things which I prefer to see as dialectics and the, the dialectics is it, there is the thing and that's not the thing and like we used to say if it ain't for you leave it alone so there, there would be ideas he would have that I didn't, I left him alone. The ideas I had that he would leave alone. And that when you have a dialectical bent, you don't necessarily see 
the necessity of fighting about what you don't agree with. You can embrace everything and what you like, you like, and what you don't like, you leave alone. And that's, that becomes difficult for many people because it, it, psychologically you're brought up with the idea of one has to conquer the other. Someone has to be right and someone has to be wrong. Well, you both can be right and you both can be wrong. You know, I mean, philosophically, there's not just A and not A. You know, that's one way to look at things. But you can be, right, not be, both not be, and both be. You understand? There's A, not A, or A prime, right? But there's A and B, and A or B. You know, I, I don't want to get too deep into <laughs> philosophy, but you understand the, the point I'm making is we didn't, we didn't, I come from a jazz background, we didn't have, you didn't, most jazz musicians were not opposed to classical music because they could understand the classical music stuff and they could play it. Whereas most of the classical musicians, particularly during that time period, couldn't play the jazz because they didn't, they couldn't deal with it. So which would you prefer to be? Someone who could play it whichever way it came or someone who knew their way but couldn't address any other way? And I'm, I'm saying your question brings us to that, to that basic philosophical thing about being. Are we going to be beings that embrace all life forms and don't get mad because somebody's different, the other, or are we going to insist that there is a way? There is no a way. If there's an a, there's got to be a not a. Benjamin, I think I should tell you that Tom would resent your calling him a demigod. And he would resent it very deeply because I don't believe that, I mean, I know this is the way we think about various literary figures that we have hierarchies and there's all kinds of machinery to reinforce a view that someone is the greatest whatever. Tom would have told you in no uncertain terms, I'm a human being, and I have my foibles just as you have yours. And when Tom wanted to get under my skin uh, in a very gentle, brotherly way and make me angry so he could laugh at me, he would say, you're so academic, you're so dull. And I would say, yeah, Tom, and if I wasn't, you wouldn't be my friend. Well, that's a, a good place to close on. Uh, once again, please thank the panelists, Kalamu Yasalam, Jerry Ward. They're going to be, they're going to be signing this amazing book uh, right next door in the, in the bookshop. Uh, please join us over there in just a few moments. Thank you all very much for coming and for celebrating Tom Dent.